So we're now going to talk with Rachel Moran. Rachel Moran is from Ireland. She's author of Paid For and founding member of Space International, co-founder also of the Irish Women's Lobby. One of the uh, things on the website, uh, Goodreads, it says, the best work by anyone on prostitution ever. Rachel Moran's Paid For fuses memor memoirists lived poignancy with the philosopher's conceptual sophistication. The result is riveting, compelling, incontestable, impossible to put down. Uh, many of us have read it and are really in awe of uh, Rachel's work, writing, but also organisational and speaking with Space International. So thank you so much, Rachel. What what we were we we're sort of thinking of talking about is your what you're working on now and thinking about now is prostitution and the politics of language. So. Rachel, uh, why is language so important? What is it you're sort of developing and thinking about? You know, I think after 10 years now involved in the feminist movement, and particularly in the, the, the sex trade survivors wing of the abolitionist movement, and this has happened in my life in steps and stages. Um, the first couple of years was located here in Ireland. And then after I began blogging, I started traveling. And after the, the book went out the year after that just exploded. So, so I've seen a lot in the last 10, 11 years. And what I notice is um, this, this thread that runs through um, activism more generally, um, th that language, whether it's gotten right or wrong, um, has a huge impact on, on how we organize, what it is we can achieve and how easy or difficult achieving those goals can be. So that's why I wanted to talk a bit about language here today. And I, I'll start off with, with the obvious um, sex walk and sex walker, which of course we should never ever condone or use or allow to slip by us even in a conversation. Um, when I'm doing interviews now with the mainstream media, be it in television or radio or anything else, I'll always ask them not to use that terminology. And I'll just be very straightforward about the fact that if they do use it, in the space of an 8, 10, 12 minute TV or radio clip, we're going to have to spend the half of the time with me dismantling, <laughs> you know, the language. So that's a good way to go about, it, I think, just to um, make it, um, you know, it's something that you just will not tolerate. And the obvious reason for that is that prostitution is neither sex nor work. Um, I also don't put up with the term sex worker because if you do, well, then by extension, you're, you're putting up with the idea that there's such a realm as sex work. Um, and, you know, the, it's one of those things that you could sit down and you could write, you could literally write a, a 20,000 word article teasing out all of the various multiple and all of the different um, nuances and subtleties and layers within all of that, you know, and we haven't got the time for that. But I just want to say that, that it's, it's not a term. I mean, with the best will in the world, I see really good, strong, solid feminists who are solid on every other issue, let that slide by them sometimes just for the sake of convenience or not having a row or moving the conversation on more quickly. But I think that we should always stop it there because every debate is won and lost on the foundation stone of language. And once you take one step in the wrong direction linguistically or allow the conversation to take one step in the wrong direction, um, well, everywhere you go from there can only lead you away from the central points that you want to, to hold. Yeah, I mean, that's so it's so important and it's sort of relevant. Um, or it reminds me of when we had Julia Long coming and talking at one of our first webinars uh, where she was saying that the moment we use the language we, we call men who say that they're women trans women, we've m lost a lot. We've, we've sort of accepted the terms of the debate. Um, have you seen um, a big battle going on uh, over, over, is it mainly the word sex work that is the battleground really, prostitution or sex work, or are there other, other words that you're seeing fought over? Oh, well, definitely. I mean, sex worker and sex work, that's the big one. And the, the history, because not everybody knows the history of that terminology. 
It came out of San Francisco sex trade of the late 1970s, early 80s. Around those few years, it exploded as a term. And it made its way across the earth. Um, and this is the most frustrating thing that I find, by the way, about that terminology, is that it has, it, yes, it was invented by the pimp lobby, but it wasn't carried and disseminated across the earth by the pimp lobby. That work was done by well-intentioned people who didn't want to see women degraded and humiliated by the use of the term prostitute. And this is another thing that I've seen time and time and time again, is that your, your biggest problem here in this, this wing of, of the movement, and I think in the movement more generally, it really isn't ill-intentioned people. Because if we abolitionists just had to worry about the pimps and the, the uh, hunters, you're talking about a much smaller uh, faction of the, the overall society. But when you're talking about well-intentioned people who don't want to cause harm, and are prepared to wade into the conversation with their ill-informed opinions. Well, that number of people multiplies exponentially. So that's what happened anyway with the term sex walk and sex walker. And that's why it's absolutely everywhere. Every journalist, every broadcaster, everybody who would call herself a feminist, almost all, it's a massive majority of people who are speaking front facing with the public are using that term. And what I think they're doing, it's fair to say, most of them are doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. And that's why it's very difficult to unpick that. Um, but you have to keep at it. Because if you see to the linguistic ground, like, as you said, Julia Long had said, and Julia has always been very solid on language. Um, and she's absolutely right. You, you just can, because when you see that ground, the, the argument will eventually disintegrate. And what about the, because I, I find that, uh, like you say, that one of the reasons people use the term sex work is because they think it gives dignity and to the women who are prostituted and, it, and it's a sort of empowering positive step, but it seems as if uh, it also has a lot of downsides because once you give it that dignity, then you can offer it to like, students at Leicester University, as they're saying for the girls, young women who are entering university, they're saying it's a valid form of work. So it's a really, it's difficult. Uh, but how, how do you get around that when you're using words? What do you do with the words? Well, first of all, you can break that argument down fairly simply by saying that you don't dignify individuals exploited within an oppressive system by dignifying the oppressive system itself. Um, that's, that's not the way to go about it. It's fairly simple logic and it's only been, um, it, it's been obscured, uh, but, it, but it's no less simple. And I think we have to just, getting back to the issue of language, keep it simple, be direct and, and be clear. And you can wrap up a lot of these arguments in the space of a sentence if you want to. Um, but we talked earlier on, you know, you'd asked about other, other uh, terms. Um, and here's a problem, and I've seen this on our side of the fence a good number of times. Um, it's a sense of confusion with women, they don't know what other language to use because they think that if they don't use the sex worker and sex work, well, that leaves them with prostitute and prostitution. And they think as if... Um, prostitute and prostitution were bookends and that they had to be used together and that you couldn't linguistically use one and discard the other. Um, but they're wrong there. Um, I will always use the term prostitution, um, but I'll never again use the term prostitute. And the thing, uh, you know, if I was to go back and write paid for again, I would be making um, linguistic alterations on every other page because you move on and you evolve and it's been eight years now since that book was first published. Um, and, and I've had a lot of experiences since then and a lot of conversations since then. And I've got to know a lot of very knowledgeable feminists in multiple different jurisdictions in the earth. And amongst all of those conversations and all that learning, there's stuff now that I would never dream of writing again. And sometimes if I'm reading a couple of paragraphs from paid for in public I'd be so mortified sometimes <laughs> like I used words like client which I would never use today 
because of course that justifies and dignifies and and normalizes what they're doing as it is if they were rather than punters as we used to call them um actually going in to buy a half a pound of sausages perfectly legitimately down the local butchers and i cannot believe my own ignorance um as a woman who had lived the sex trade for seven years and spent years i'd spent 10 years writing that book and i still littered it with the kind of language that i would reject today and so what about are you will you uh, have you written anything uh with, with sort of with these thoughts or are you going to be able to write something that we can read uh to sort of update some of your thinking on language I'm working on something at the moment, but I have this kind of peculiar thing that I think about writing something as if you were um, hose in the garden, if you know what I'm saying. And if you talk about it, it's kind of like you reduce the pressure. Do you know what I mean? So I'd be very tight lipped about that book, but I am working regularly on, on, on my next book. Um, and, and yeah, I will be covering these these areas, too. Um, but I just want to make a point about the prostitution prostitute um situation that we have to deal with linguistically and I think one of the things that I'm trying to kind of remind myself quite often and I've been at this for years now and it's not been the easiest thing but it's just to be gentle uh, with the people that I meet no matter you know uh, where they're at it's difficult to be gentle with people who are talking offensive nonsense up into your face but I do try um, <laughs> you know, you know at least I'm trying to try the thing is I, I've met women who think that um, we have to collapse all of that prostitution, prostitute language. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, and I, I, I think that um, slavery is the most obvious comparison. Um, and, and Janice Raymond has made some fantastic points around this in her most recent book, um, Not a Choice, Not a Job, um, which is that you, you cannot you cannot collapse um, an oppressive system by the refusal to name it. You just can't. And that's why I'll always use the term prostitution. But to call people caught up within that system, the vast majority of whom are, are women and girls, prostitutes, is to do something that would kind of probably take too long for us within the scope of this interview to break down. But it's... Um, it's very akin to, it reminds me of the slavery dynamic in that, and, and, and I've learned now to think, it, it, for example, slave is not a term I use anymore. Even in my own thoughts, I think um, enslaved people, because what that does then is it brings the perpetrator into the picture. It clarifies the situation itself and it doesn't, um, infuse the individual with the essence of what has been done to them and makes very important clarifications and separations. And I think that's what we need to do with, with the terms prostitution and prostitute. So would, so would you use the term prostituted women? Oh, definitely, yeah. That would be the, the correct term. Um, yeah, and that's, uh, for, I think there are many of us who are, um, you know, we've, we've got more involved either, you know, we've started again to get involved in radical feminism and feminism and politics um, in the last, say, three or four years. And so it's really useful to have clear sort of uh, advice uh, from women who've been really involved in these different areas. So that's that's really good. So would you say that if women read your book, uh, they should maybe also read Janice Raymond's up-to-date book, The Not a Choice, Not a Job? Is, is there anything else they should be looking at in terms of language? Um, well, there's so many good books out there now. Um, you know, I think that, um, that Sheila Jeffries, uh, The Industrial... Vagina was a great book, and I know it's it's come out a while ago now. Um, really made me smile when I first clapped eyes on that book to see that not only, um, you know, I, I just loved the, the directness, the straightforwardness of that title. Um, and also, you know, uh, Julie Bindle's very recent book that came out a um, few years after mine, um, The Pimping of Prostitution. Um, we're seeing more than, than we'd ever seen, um, you know, like 20 years ago, there was so little 
written about this. Um, you had Kathleen Barry's um, Female Sexual Slavery and the Prostitution of Sexuality. That's a book, I think the Prostitution of Sexuality is a book that's overlooked um, to a large degree when we have these conversations. Um, it came out in the early to mid nineties. It's a more nuanced book. I think it's a very important book. Um, and if we're gonna look a bit more closely into um, pornography, I always felt that Catherine McKinnon's Only Words um, was certainly the most important book I'd ever read on pornography. In terms of bringing it also to the Irish women's lobby that you've just been, your co-founder of just recently this year, can you tell us about what, what's the aim of the women's lobby and also if there are any sort of relevant words that you're sort of thinking mm -hmm. of now you're using for the lobby's work? Well, you know, um, we had been seeing scandal after scandal coming out of Amnesty International going back at least 15 years, probably longer. And what you couldn't help but notice about these four different uh, string of scandals was that every single one of them pertained to women's rights and to the absolute contemptible dearth of respect that Amnesty had for women's rights. Um, and the thing that tipped me over the edge was late last year when we saw Amnesty International tag teaming with the National Women's Council of Ireland, um, along with the TENI, I think that stands for the Trans Equality Network of Ireland. So those three groups and many others, um, including uh, belong to and you know uh, LGBT groups, including those that work with youth, had all got together and signed, I think probably the most disgraceful document that I've seen ever come out of the so-called left-hand side of the aisle, um, which was the straightforward call for, and I quote, the removal of political and media representation. Uh, for, and that was from, from anybody who had a problem with the, with the obvious and devastating consequences of the 2015 um, Ireland Gender Recognition Act. Um, so we've now got grown adult male perverts walking around our women's jails including men who have been declared by the Tavistock Clinic not to have uh, gender dysphoria in the first place. Um, so anyway, we, we don't have time for all of that, but just to say, it, if anybody wants to thank anybody for the, the formation of the um, Irish Women's Lobby, it's, it's not actually myself or any of the other founders who ought to be thanked. It's the National Women's Council of Ireland because that was the step that went too far for us. It was outrageous and, and as anti-democratic as is possible to be. It was a straightforward fascist act, attempt and action as far as we're concerned. And I still- I mean, these, these, these organizations which are in our name uh, have by, redefining the word woman are not not for us anymore so it's just it's just a little tweak of the name to say and including men who say they're women and then they've removed a whole organization from us so yeah it's it, uh, it really linked up to words yeah so th they uh have any of them changed their minds or are they still sticking to their guns in a very sneaky move what we noticed was that the um while the original letter is still there, and so of course it would be since it's been screenshot to Helen back, um, on the actual um, campaign link, or the, the because it had been linked to a, I think it was a change.org, um, they, what they had done was removed the offending couple of lines. Um, so in that really sneaky, disingenuous way, um, they're not prepared to stand over those lines. Um, but instead of issue the apology and the retraction and remove their names from the letter, which is what anybody with any integrity would do, um, they've just removed a couple of lines. So I think that that, that to me is, is so straightforwardly contemptible behaviour. So what, what we're seeing is just the contempt of women. It, it feels to me like a spiral, um, ever descending spiral of contempt towards women that I'm looking at in this country. And the fact that it's coming out of the likes of the National Women's Council makes it all the more disgusting to me personally. 
um, as an Irish woman, but also as an Irish woman who's put her shoulder to the wheel for the last 10 years in this country and pushed very hard and had to, you know, sit up in the full public view and talk about the worst things that ever happened to me to initiate and, and create some legislative change here, to then have the National Women's Council, who I ought to be able to turn to and rely on, and who, are, who were in fact part of the core group of the Turn Off the Red Light campaign, along with Space International, the group that I founded. So what I'm seeing is that every single time you have a situation where an organization is forced to choose between women's rights and trans rights. We women are flung under the bus every single time. And I'm tired of it, I'm sick of it. And the, the wall to wall lies that are spewed about their being and, and in, including from the National Women's Council who say that there is no conflict of interest between women's rights and trans rights. And I have that in a personal email from the policy person in the National Women's Council. And all I can say about that is that um, you have got to have your head very determinedly rammed into the sand to come out with a statement like that. Just wanted to encourage women who may hear some of the more recent nonsense language doing the rounds like um, sex buyers law to, you know, as a reframing of the Nordic model to, to really please do not support that language because that's an example of us speaking out of both sides of our mouth. Um, we cannot say that what men are buying here is sexual access to women's bodies and is not in fact sex at all. And at the same time, reframe the Nordic model as the sex buyer's law. We're arguing against ourselves. So I'd just like to ask people to keep an eye on, on the language, please. I was thinking about the, the transvestites that we had to deal with in 1990s prostitution in Dublin. Um, and the, it, I suppose back then it was very much like the difference between the salad in the 1990s and the stew in the present day. Because back then we had men who were straightforwardly um, upfront about the fact that they were fetishists and that they were enjoying this and that they were, um, they were just turning up, they were paying their money, they'd be there for a couple of hours or maybe an overnight. Um, there was no, um, there was none of the nonsense that you see today. I mean, they were not pretending to be, they were not pretending to be women in the same way. They were, in other words, they were honest about the fact that they were pretending to be women. They weren't dealing, serving up the double deception that they were, <laughs> were women and were also being honest about being women, if you can follow my logic. Um, and, and honestly, and this might sound strange to some women, but in the context of 1990s prostitution, they were amongst the easiest men you would ever deal with. And I had no problem dealing with them within that context because they straightforwardly kept their penises to themselves, which was a highly unusual situation in the context of prostitution. Um, but what, now what we see in the present day is, uh, it, it, it's like that fantasy has been taken to the furthest point of the line. And the, um, the phrase that men who appropriate a uh, female identity, this is what we're, we're dealing with now from so many quarters. Um, and it's the difference between somebody um, appropriating that identity for a sexual kick for an hour or an evening and a person who appropriates it and demands and insists that, that you acknowledge that appropriation as if it were fact. Um, and that, and, and to, to listen to even what was just a brief overview there about the intricacies and the entwinements of this attitude and this behavior and, and pornography I mean, I'd imagine that's something that you could study for the rest of your life, but at least we're touching on it. So thank you for that.